Hello again, brothers and sisters, and welcome again to Hardcore Truth, where we're bringing the light of truth into the darkness of apostasy and compromise. Uh, our goal, as you know, is to find and to feed the hungry and find and give drink to the thirsty. We believe that they are out there. And so uh, if you're helped by these, I, I ask you again to click on the sub subscribe button and the notification button, and please tell somebody about this. And let's get the word out there and uh, reach other people who are interested in hardcore truth. <laughs> uh, so if you would like to contact me, the email is pathfindersmin at gmail.com. So we're moving along now in our series uh, called The Theology of Worship and Service. And we have come to chapter 25 of the book of Leviticus. And this message is titled, The Sabbatical Year, the Year of Jubilee, Redemption of Property and of Persons, Entering God's Rest and Discerning the Times. Kind of a long title. Uh, so let's pray as we begin today. Lord, we thank you for your word. <laughs> Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Has been since the day you, you called me, Lord God. And save me, Lord God, your word, Lord God. What do we have in this world that's stable and steady and never changing? It's your word, Lord God. And we also know, Lord God, that your word is a person. Your word is truth, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we draw nigh to the Lord Jesus Christ today in the word, I pray that you will touch our hearts, that you will put your Holy Spirit upon me, that I might share this message uh, and that you would put your spirit upon those that hear, and on both of us, Lord, that we would live this message. And I pray it, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we're now in chapter 25 uh, of this great book, and uh, two words would basically sum up chapter 25 of the book of Leviticus, and that would be revival and rest. Uh, the, the words... Uh, revival and rest are, are, are great words, but more importantly, they're great needs in the life of any human being, revival and rest. Uh, and in, as we come closer and closer to the last days and the return of the Lord, revival and rest become of extreme importance to us. The, the days just prior to the second coming of our Lord uh, are days when we need, like never before, revival and rest. Uh, we're not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse expository teaching uh, through this chapter because most of what's in this chapter we have already covered in previous chapters. Uh, but let me say a few words uh, on each of the points of chapter 25. Then I'm going to get into a message about what hinders and how we can enter the Sabbath Jubilee rest in these last of the last days. And so, in verses 1 through 7, the Word of God speaks about the seventh year, and, and that it would be the sabbatical year, and it was a time for the land to give the land a rest as well as man a rest. Uh, the sabbatical year uh, for the land was to deliver the Israelites from covetousness, Boy, is that a big problem in our lives, especially in America. I suppose it's the same. In fact, I know it's the same. Even in third world countries, there's covetousness. The heart of man is filled with covetousness to desire things that we don't have, to somehow think if we had some uh, a bigger car or a bigger boat or a new car or a new this or a new that, that somehow that would fulfill us. And that, 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 that lust, that covetousness burns in people's souls if it's not brought to the cross. And, and so God was trying to deliver his people and show them a way to be free from covetousness and teach them a life of simplicity. Oh boy, what a word. <laughs> 
I remember years ago, there was a book that came into my life and it was called uh, Simplicity. That was the title of it. And I would get to a certain point in the first chapter of the book where there was this statement made, simplicity is a very complex matter. And I would just close the book and put it away. I tried to read it two or three times and never did read it uh, because simplicity is a complex matter. And I don't want simplicity to be a complex matter. Let's not make it complicated. Let's just seek God as to get rid of covetousness, for to be rid of covetousness is to live in simplicity. I don't know if the book ever said that, but that's something that God has taught me. In fact, the the 70 years of captivity that Israel had uh, in Egypt was because they did not give the land the sabbatical rest. And so uh, in verse 8 through 24, God also then speaks of the year of Jubilee. This was on the 50th year, and it would, it would be held on the Day of Atonement, and all the land was returned to its owner. All debt was forgiven, and all servants were set free. Uh, and so again, uh, dealing with covetousness and calling people to a life of simplicity, Jubilee speaks of freedom. Uh, from debt. Uh, Let's back up. Jubilee uh, speaks of freedom from sin and from the bondage of sin, but also uh, from the debt that we owe for sin. And it also speaks of freedom from monetary debt, freedom from bondage, a life of simplicity. In verses 25 through 55, God speaks of the redemption of property and the redemption of persons. Our Lord God doesn't want his people in bondage. He wants them free. He wants them in revival, and he wants them in Sabbath rest. Christianity is not a life of constant bondage. It's a life of victory. We are to be more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so uh, this is where God begins to speak of these things in his people's uh, lives In in the last days, we're going to see, and we are seeing, many people, excuse me, in bondage to financial debt, mostly because of covetousness, which is a form of idolatry. Uh, And and so uh, we today see so many, in fact, probably all of us, are, are, are living complicated lives, far more complicated than God wants them. Uh, we're living lives that are driven, uh, and God never wants us to be living lives that are driven. In fact, uh, speak of another book that came out uh, some time ago. It was called The Purpose Driven Life, and there's no way I was going to read that book because it, I don't want to be driven. And it turned out that the guy who wrote it is... Uh, uh, a bozo anyway. And so uh, uh, we we don't need and should not need to be in bondage to debt, to complicated lives, and to lives that are driven. And But be, why are so many people, well, the, the advertising and all the, uh, the, the covetousness that came started in, uh, well, I'm sure it was there forever, but in the 50s, after the war was over and Korean War was over, uh, advertising and, and things came out that people never had before. Uh, just as an example, washing machines and dryers. Uh, all this stuff was supposed to make our lives more simple. How about computers? <clears throat> Weren't they supposed to simplify our lives? Well, I haven't simplified mine, and I don't think they've simplified anybody's because they just make things more complicated and also make it so everything that we do can be tracked by the government and by advertising agencies who bombard us with all of that stuff. And so most of the leaders in Christianity uh, have 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 lived lived complicated lives, complicated lives that are full of bondage and full of debt, and so uh, uh, that's why God's people don't have rest and don't have revival, uh, but rather themselves are are being driven. And so, I've traveled quite a bit, especially in my younger years, and uh, I visited many fellowships in many different lands. And I have come to three 
very strong conclusions, I believe, in a fair and impartial look at the body of Christ. The first is that many preachers today, I say many, maybe most, I was listening to one just this morning as I was doing a little project out in my garage, I had the Christian radio station on, and uh, these preachers today are nice guys. The second is that they're not calling people to the old paths of the cross and of repentance. And so the third is that there are very few Christians who are experiencing true freedom from bondage and the rest of God because of covetousness, and which leads to a complicated life. So let's deal, first of all, with this business of being a nice guy. Why is that an issue? I, mean, I like nice guys, don't you? <laughs> uh, but nice guys don't call people to repent. And there's nothing in the Bible that calls men to be nice guys. Uh, certainly kind, compassionate, merciful, all those kinds of things. But nice is something different. Uh, there's a softness to niceness. And we, we don't see that softness. We don't see that in the preaching of Peter or, or Paul or Stephen or any, any of the, any of the uh, prophets. Uh, nice guys don't call people to repent. Nice guys don't call people to have diligent, determined, desperate, disciplined uh, lives that cause them to be light-bearing soldier priests as disciples of the Lord. Priests of God uh, are disciple-makers. Uh, yes, indeed, again, we should be meek, we should be kind, we should be humble, but, but we should not be thought of as a nice guy. If somebody said I was a nice guy, I would consider that as, a, as an insult. Uh, none of these preachers in God's words were nice, word were nice guys. Think of Elijah, Elisha, Haggai, Amos, Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Peter, Stephen. None of these are nice guys. If a man wants to model his preaching today after someone, he surely shouldn't be modeling it after some uh, uh, human being uh, that lives today. He should be modeling it after these guys from the Word of God who were human beings, and yet they made it into the Bible, and they ain't a preacher alive today or since the writing of the Bible that's made it into the Bible. And so these are the guys that we need to model not only our preaching after, but our lives after. What has happened to masculinity today? It's dead and laying in the streets. And uh, these young men today, they don't even know what real masculinity is. But there's our examples, and primarily the example of Christ it, it, this is not a day, we do not live in a day for nice guys like Mr. Rogers or preachers who, who, who speak of a sick, uh, sensual love for God. Uh, th these kind of preachers cause people to remain indolent, which means slow to heal, slow to change, desiring little or no pain. Boy, is that a picture of people today. Uh, this kind of preaching, this kind of living, uh, causes people to, it keeps them from revival. It keeps them from jubilee. It keeps them from the rest of God and keeps them in bondage to covetousness. I heard a sermon from a nice guy. He's a nice guy, uh, easy to like. <laughs> uh, but I heard him preach a sermon that, that said that Jesus is just crazy about you. Well, that's not true. He said that Jesus needs you and he's crazy about you. That's not true. Jesus isn't crazy about me. He's not crazy at all. Uh, and he doesn't need me. I need him. And what a difference that makes in a person's life. Uh, we're never going to find revival, rest, and jubilee in some soft, lovesick, rebellious self-willed uh, concept of God, nor will we find these things in prideful, academic, navel-gazing, fundamentalist Bible studies. This is also a big problem. So we cannot allow 
uh, academic, heady teaching to enable people to remain indolent in the pew, uh, enslaved by their brilliance. Some a high educated academic teacher can cause priests to think that they must have the smoothness and the education that they have in order to be in the ministry. They, without intent, I don't think it's intentional, are saying that you're incapable of being like me, so just sit there and I'm going to dazzle you uh, with my brilliance and feed you and take care of you. That is so wrong. Both nice guys and heady academic guys are without intent keeping people enslaved to the bondage of the soft bigotry of low expectations. They cause people to have low expectations of God. They cause people to have low expectations then for God in them and through them. And therefore, their lives remain in bondage. And if you have low expectations for God and for yourself, what else is left but covetousness of the things of the world? And so the, these kinds, these nice guys and these academic guys, they, they're neutralizing uh, God's people. Uh, they cause people from never entering into the priesthood that God has called them to. And without intent, they, they then therefore keep them from personal revival, jubilee, rest, and the true worship of God. Yes, what I'm saying is, is that nice guys are not calling people to true repentance and overly academic giants are neutralizing the saints. Now, does that mean that there's something wrong with a high education? Not at all. But there is something wrong with knowledge elitism. Peter, James, and John are said to be, by the leaders of that day, by the highly educated of that day, to be ignorant and unlearned men. In other words, they had no formal education. And so, therefore, they were considered ignorant and unlearned, but they weren't ignorant and unlearned. They were the men that Jesus chose to lead his church and they had been with Jesus, and therefore they had an education. Their education would be called autodidactic or self-taught, but or uh, better put, they were discipled. You see, this Greek form of education that we live under today, of degree system, of you you read something in a book and then you are able to vomit it back out onto a, onto a test and then therefore you are educated. Oh, that's not the way God wanted people educated. That's not the way the Jews educate used to educate. It, it, it was through a discipleship, an apprenticeship, whereas that you knew something when you were able to do it. And this degree system that we, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the degree system that we have today, you need to know where it comes from. It comes from the Masons. Uh, why else would anybody wear a mortar board on their head when they get a degree? And so the degrees and the mortar board flow right out of the ancient Babylonian Mason uh, uh, belief system. And our education system is flowing out of that, and it produces an elitism, uh, an arrogance, and a pride that looks down their nose at people who have an apprenticeship with Jesus or have been apprenticed by somebody and have learned or been autodidactic and, and have, have learned to do things by teaching themselves or having other people apprentice them into it. So, uh, this is an awful thing. We, I guess we just don't realize how awful it really is. And so we've got to separate ourselves from this arrogance. And those of you who have degrees and all of that kind of stuff, uh, come on, come down off of that high horse and realize that your job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and you can't do that if you think you're better than them. And so that's a big problem. Uh, how many of you believe that we're living in the last days? I, I'm sure all of you do. Listen to the Word of God. For, let me just back up a minute. I, I just had a 
thought flashed through my mind of someone giving a commencement speech at a prestigious university, dressed in their royal robes and with the, the sash and the, and the, and the uh, fancied up mortar board on their head. Oh, God have mercy. Is that ever a picture of a Pharisee? Anyway, we live in the last days, and what should we expect? 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, for the time will come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of our God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? What are we seeing here? Judgment. We have entered into <clears throat> the judgment of the last days. And where does it begin? It begins with me and with you. And if you're Mr. Nice Guy or Mr. Elitist, you better repent of that. And if you have been a victim of the soft bigotry of low expectations and think because you don't have a formal education or that you should be a nice guy, you need to repent of that as well. Nice guys don't tell the truth when it needs telling. As the world begins to melt down in last day's judgment, <laughs> what we have is nice guys using the pulpit to tickle people's ears. And whether you be a, a great academic teacher or a shallow, lovesick enabler, there seems to be a polarizing in the church as people are gravitating to one end of that or the other. Uh, by this I mean that the charismatics... Some of them might be called charismaniacs. Uh, try to fill the, the void that we have today of victory and jubilee and rest and freedom from covetousness with loud music and light shows and soft preaching and circus acts. Boy, does that make me mad. It's nothing to have a praise service last for an hour and then a short word that most of the time is, is soft and nice and shallow. And it appears to be, wow, a great move of God is going on here today. There's a mighty river of the Lord flowing here today. But you could walk across that river without getting your ankles wet because it's so shallow. And we don't need shallowness today. One pastor I heard titled his message, Living in the wedding garment of his grace. He went on to teach that God is so in love with us that he sees each of us literally and individually like a groom sees a bride. Then he went on to say that Jesus has covered us with a wedding dress and that this dress becomes a part of us, and that that is how we are sanctified. I heard a man say that. No, it's the blood that covers us, and it's the word and the cross that we take up that sanctifies us. This stuff is flowing right out of the ancient heresy called bridal mysticism, which is a, which is a heresy that teaches that the individual believer is literally a bride instead of the church corporately being seen as a bride. You hardly ever hear about the cross or the blood in some of these uh, charismatic circles anymore. This is one extreme. But the other extreme is the heady academic fundamentalist teachers. Some of them are trying to fill the void of victory and rest and jubilee with academic knowledge of the objective word of God. Why, they know the composition of the soil that Jesus walked on as he walked on the road to Calvary. They know the uh, metallurgy of the nails that went into his hands and all of this kind of stuff that has absolutely no application to anything. And many of them are guilty 
of a idolatry called bibliolatry, where they're worshiping the Bible rather than the one that it portrays. They have forbidden the Holy Spirit in their meetings and even give teachings on YouTube and other places against the Holy Spirit, saying that the gifts of the Holy Spirit no longer exist today and using their high-sounding nonsense to prove it. And so they're left to do what? To rely on prideful, elitist, formal, academic head knowledge for victory in their lives. That's Gnosticism, by the way. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love, charity, edifieth. And God is not in love with us. He loves us like a father. And Jesus loves us with the love of a brother and of a friend, not of a bedmate. God help us. God help us. And these academics are blinded by their own brilliance. And they don't lead people to revival and rest in jubilee because they deny the power of the Holy Spirit. And the other end of it, the, the charismatics, they, 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 they've fallen into a false Holy Spirit, many of them. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form of godliness but denying, which means to contradict, to disavow, to reject and refuse the power, which is dunamis, miraculous power there, from such turn away. One dispensationalist said to me, I have everything that I need from God. As we were speaking about his need for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I have everything that I need. Yeah, it's available my answer to him was, yes, it's available, but you don't have it because you don't want it. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after charity, but desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. That Greek word means to be zealous, to envy, to covet, and strong desire. You see, covetousness by itself isn't a sin. It's not a sin to be covetous. It depends on what you're covetous for. If you're covetous for the things of the world, that's a sin. But if you're covetous and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, that ain't a sin. It's a command. Because 1 Corinthians 14, 1 is in the imperative, which means it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Follow after charity, pursue charity, and desire spiritual gifts we don't have all that god has for us because we don't desire and we don't ask and when we do we deny the power of the cross and then we deny the power of the holy spirit one of these academics a former chancellor by the way of uh, dallas theological seminary taught that one did not even need to know Christ in order to be saved. If he's predestined to be saved, he said, the blood was covering him and God saw him through Christ. Wow. Do you know what that produces? No fear of God. Hyper-Calvinism. No fear of God. Everybody's just saved. If they've been predestined, they're saved. Don't even need to, to come to Christ because they're already covered. That's what he said. His people are caught up in Gnosticism, thinking and worshiping the letter of the Bible through human effort. Both of these kinds of ministries are living in self-sufficiency and vain religiosity that flows from the flesh. God help us. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The first group, the Charismatics, uh, they follow em emotion-driven, subjective voices. The other, uh, the cerebral-driven, objective, elitist form of Gnosticism. Uh, 
one is accused of, of being involved in emotionally driven uh, stuff and the other excludes any emotion from their lives whatsoever. God gave us our emotions. The first group is falling into a shallow experience with the power of God. The second won't allow it. If only these two groups could see their need for one another, how different things would be, because I'm not accusing either of these groups of not being Christians and not being my brothers and sisters or that I despise any of them. Oh, how we need each other. And oh, how we need a unity today based on humility and truth and sound doctrine to bring a balance into our lives. While returning from a mission trip in Cuba years ago, I had experienced on this trip something that God was trying to show me. And I shared it with my daughter when I got home. What was it? Well, I had ministered in, in a fundamentalist church system while being in, in Cuba. And I also ministered in a Methodist charismatic situation uh, system and also in Assembly of God, Pentecostal situation system. And so I got a real broad view of these two different camps. And my goodness, in the charismatic and Pentecostal circles, you go to their praise time, and oh my, oh my, I couldn't stand on my feet many times. I had to fall on my knees and on my face with the, the presence of the Lord as the praise of God was going forth. And it was so wonderful. And people were being healed of, of sicknesses. And people were being delivered from devils and from bondage in their lives. And people were being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It was, it was a wonderful experience. And it was, for the most part, real. There was the false going on as well. I don't want to get into that right now. No, but yeah, it was wonderful. And then came the preacher. He might just as well have been a cheerleader for some sports team because uh, it was rah rah Jesus and uh, and a message that that just kept the people hyped up about the Lord. But there was no depth to it whatsoever. No call to repentance. And then. In the fundamentalist situation system that I was ministering in at the same trip, why the the praise time was as 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 dry as a cracker. Uh, it, it, there was nothing there, and there wasn't allowed anything there. The pastor got up and started the service with a prayer, and then he used his arms like this and directed the people in singing a hymn while the lady played the piano. And then it stopped. And then uh, some announcements were given, and then a young lady came up, and the lady at the piano, they led the people in another hymn, and then it stopped. And then something else went on, and then another hymn, and then it stopped. And then he came and preached a message. My goodness, their praise was nothing as compared to that of the charismatic Pentecostal circles. Excuse me just a minute. I'm in a little trouble with my voice today. Speaking too much. Anyway, uh, the extremes were there. Now, I'm not saying that those fundamentalists weren't praising God. They were. I'm just trying to draw a distinction between the two. Now, when the fundamentalist preacher got up there, oh boy, what a good message he preached. Very sound in doctrine and deep in the word of God and calling the people to the cross and calling the people to repentance. And when I got home, I sat in the living room with my daughter and I told her of this experience. She was just a young girl, I suppose, uh, 12, 13 years old, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood. I doubt that she knew what I was even talking about, but uh, I had to tell somebody, and there she was. So I told her this, and then I said this. I am going to spend the rest of my life trying to bring those two concepts together. I want to have praise in my life that's flowing 
with the with with God. I want very desperately, I earnestly desire spiritual gifts in my life and to be super saturated with the Holy Spirit and to be flowing in that. But I also want the depth of the Word of God. I want those two extremes to come to a place of balance in my life. And I have been working on that ever since. I don't know if I've arrived, uh, but I, I continue to strive. Like Paul, forgetting what lies behind, I press on towards the prize. I hope and I challenge you to do the same thing, whichever system you're in, whether it be the fundamentalists or the charismaniacs, try to bring those charism, charismatics, try to bring those two things together in your life and seek out leaders who are trying to bring those things together in their lives. And if you're a leader, by all means, bring those things together into your life. God have mercy. I have ministered in all of these settings. And what have I learned? All that I'm sharing with you and this, I need my brothers and sisters to bring a balance to my own error. God does speak to us subjectively, and the manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for us today, and they are all subjective in, in a way that should be connected to the Word of God. The word, the subjectivity has to flow out of the objective Word of God, not out of just emotion. But there's nothing wrong with emotion. God gave us emotion. We should not be seeking emotional experiences, but the experience brings the emotion. What's wrong with that? The spirit of the word has got to flow from the letter of the word, from every jot and every tittle, though. And that's really important. Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall in no ways pass away until all be fulfilled and all was fulfilled in him. And so it moves to the spirit of the law, the, not the letter, the spirit, which is a higher standard. The more you cut out the objective word of God, the more you will have the subjective flowing from the flesh, or worse, uh, centering on some sick, romantic love and feminized music will cause the subjective to flow out of the, a the distorted fleshly emotion. It will be flowing out of the emotion rather than the emotion flowing out of the gift. One fellowship that I was visiting, I think I mentioned this at one message before, had men coming up in front and giving prophetic words about Christ, kissing them and hugging them. They, they have totally lost sight of their own manhood. Oh, God, they have totally lost sight of their own manhood and the masculinity of God. Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a man of war and the Yahweh is his name. God spoke to me that morning. He said, I am a man of war and I've come to make war with the world, the flesh, and the devil in you. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I bowed my head, and I said, God, I'm on your side. That was a good prayer. <laughs> Are you on his side? With the world, the flesh, the war that he has, with the world, the flesh, and the devil in you? Let's move to the other side. The more you rely on human knowledge of the letter of the word of God, the further you fall from ministering the Spirit in the Spirit. Galatians 3, 5, Therefore, uh, he therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, do it, does he by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are there miracles among you? Not in that group. I have always believed that I was living in the last days, but now I'm seeing what that means. Within these two extremes, we have groups that will more and more fall into excess and, and, and deep deception. 
on the one side, it will look like beautiful words that are nothing more than high-sounding nonsense of romance. On the other side, they will look like rigid solutions that basically say, fix yourself on the outside by the rigid obedience to the letter. Some years ago, many years ago, a long, long time ago, <laughs> I was when I was studying to be licensed as a counselor, I went to a seminar, I think it was a week-long seminar, in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, it, I'm not going to name the, the group, but it was a fundamentalist group that had put together a manual on counseling. Very good, by the way, except for one thing. And I'll tell you about that in a second. I'll tell you why it was very good. Because it, it, it had, you could go through the, the, the list of the, the directory there, and every kind of a problem that man would have emotionally, and all of the scriptures in the Bible that are the solution to that problem, fantastic work, very well done. Except, A, they didn't believe in the baptism with the Holy Spirit. They didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they didn't believe in demonic oppression or possession at all. And everything was simply, apply the word to your life and you will be free. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> it's got to be the Holy Spirit doing it from the inside in our hearts as we eat the, the living word of God. And, 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 and yes, you might change outwardly, but I don't think that's going to get rid of the covetousness. I don't think that's going to bring peace and rest because I know for a fact that in the profile, the, the legal, the, the profile that cops have of pedophiles is that he's a deacon in a fundamentalist church. It's so common that that gets into the profile. My goodness, we've got to have the Holy Spirit. Take the word of God and turn it into who we are from the inside out. But neither of these groups, both are in error. Neither will be able to lead people to true revival, rest and jubilee, and freedom from covetousness. However, they're, they're, they're going to look like the real, and, 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 and we've got to be able to know the difference, and we've got to seek that balance because Satan himself looks like an angel of light. The fundamentalists will continue to see all that's wrong in the world and lose that love and compassion and mercy and separate themselves from the sinner in such a way as that they, oh, we don't want to be around them. That isn't what Christ did. They'll reject, isolate themselves and betray and symbolically kill their brothers and sisters because they don't believe the same way about some thing. This is what happens when we follow the letter of the law and not the spirit. This is what, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a group in this town that I live in that, that's so caught up in this. And my goodness, if you meet someone from that, what do I call it? Uh, organization. I don't want to call it a church, and I don't want to want to call it a fellowship organization. You meet somebody from that organization; they don't want to know anything about you. They don't want to, if they find out that you're a Christian. They, the first question that they're going to ask is, "Do you believe in tongues?" If you believe in tongues, then they don't believe you're a Christian. They want to know. The second question is, "Do you believe you can lose your salvation?" And if you believe that you can lose your salvation, then they don't want nothing to do with you. Totally separate over those two issues. Kill you, isolate from you, hate you. Wow! That's, that's what I'm talking about. And boy, they have heady teaching. This is what happens when we cut the power of the Holy Spirit out of our experience. This is what happens when we say that the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit are not for us today. The Pharisee was in love with the letter of the law, and they could not see nor respond to the Holy Spirit and secretly lived in sin. That's what troubled Christ about them, was not what they preached, but the way they lived, secretly, probably pedophiles. <laughs> Luke 15, 17 brings us to an 
interesting experience. And it came to pass on a certain day when he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Julie and and Jerusalem. There was lots of them. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Very important to see this. Where was this? That's the story of when they peeled back the roof and they let the guy down in, uh, in, in, into the midst of Jesus, the paralytic. And Jesus healed the paralytic and the Pharisees and the doctors of the law found some way to criticize that. The house was filled with Pharisees and doctors of the law. We see this right here. They'd come from everywhere. They filled up that house and the presence of the Lord, the, the, the Lord's presence was there to heal them. The power, meaning dunamis, of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, was present there to heal them. Not one of them was healed. Not one, just the paralytic that got lowered down through the roof. Why? Matthew 13, 15, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. The same is true today. We have people like this today on both sides of this fence. There he was, Christ himself, standing in front of them. They couldn't see him. Oh, brothers and sisters, the book is the word of God. But the book was never meant to be an academic exercise of self-aggrandizement. These flame and fundies, they say that God has done away with the gifts of the Spirit. And the Bible is that which is perfect and have fallen away into elitist academic pride. First Corinthians, let's look at it for a second. Chapter 13, 8 through 12 says, Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Let me just pause there for a second. Has knowledge vanished away? Okay, let me go on. It shall vanish away. For now we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, now, we see through a glass darkly. But then, when that which is perfect is come, face to face. For now, we know in part. But then, when that which is perfect is come, we shall know even as we are known. Now, I read that because that's the scripture that the uh, dispensational people, those who have done away with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, say that they're not for us today. That's the scripture that they use. Now, these are people who claim to love the Bible. And boy, are they risking the scriptures because knowledge has not gone away. And I do not know Jesus the same way that he knows me, and neither do you, and neither do they. And I do not know as as I am known. (laughs) I do not see him face to face. So how could the Bible be that which is perfect that this scripture is is referring to? It's not. That which is perfect is the second coming of Christ. The Bible was meant to be and is the living word of God and a discerner of our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. Kept in balance. Hebrews 4.12, word of God is quick, that means alive, (laughs) and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder and soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen to that. But we also need 
what the Bible, that living word, speaks of, and that would be the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but not some circus performer where we have removed the Holy Spirit's first name. As we have seen, the word does not say that in the last days we're going to see a widespread revival. What does it say? Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away, apostasy, to stand in opposition to truth. As we have seen, the word falling away, uh, that's, that's what it means. When, when we criticize the mainline denominations because they uh, baptize infants and ordain unqualified people, we're quick to do that. But we need to look at ourselves, us, those of us who are fundamentalists and those of us who are Pentecostal charismatics, we need to look at ourselves. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 11, 31, referring back to uh, the judgment begins at the house of God. It begins with you, it begins with me, but if we would judge ourselves, then we wouldn't be judged. <laughs> Both of these groups I have described are falling away and standing against truth and hindering the priesthood. How? Because truth is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Oh boy, these are perilous times. And the error that we're seeing in both of these groups is causing a lot of problems. Just like the word says they will do. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Both camps. Itching ears. Oh, tickle my ears. There was a neighbor that we had years ago, lived across the fence. She's gone on from this world, hopefully to heaven, fundamentalist her and her husband. Every winter they would go to Florida, fine, as long as you're ministering there, <laughs> involved in the Great Commission there, but none of them are. So maybe there's an exception, <laughs> but they weren't. They would go to a Christian compound in Florida, and live in luxury and then come back in the spring this lady is one of the worst gossips that i have ever seen in my life an angry bitter gossip but she spent the whole winter and she would come back and she would stand across the fence and as she was asking me about what was going on with this neighbor and what was going on with that neighbor and was getting nothing from me but she would tell me oh what a wonderful winter we had Dr. So-and-so came and spoke on this, and Dr. So-and-so came and spoke on that, and Dr. So-and-so came and spoke on this. But none of it changed her life. She was still a bitty, bitter, angry gossip. She just went to get her ears tickled with high-sounding academia. And the other is true. We've got fellowships full of people who are rolling on the floor and clacking like ducks and barking like dogs and running around and falling backwards and all this kind of stuff. And nothing ever changes in their lives. Just getting their ears tickled. Well, there are exceptions. The, the one rejects sound doctrine for signs, false, by the way, signs and wonders, smoke uh, shows and light shows and false prophets. They, they, they tell people, uh, come as you are. God, God just loves you as you are. The problem is that the preaching that they're preaching without the cross says just stay the way you are. That's fine with God. They show up on Sunday after Sunday with their women dressed like prostitutes and the men looking like an effeminate sissy and the youth are lost. 1 Timothy 2, 9-11 through 11, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Whatever happened to that? With shamed facedness. Whatever happened to that? And sobriety. Not with 
braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to assert authority over a man, but to be in silence. Whatever happened to that? Does that mean that the women can't prof- prophesy or, or, or exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit? No. It means they're not supposed to be challenging the teacher and that the teacher should be a man of God. <laughs> First Corinthians 9, 6, 9 through 11. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, these charismaniac churches are full of them nor idolaters both camps full of them nor adulterers secret in one open in the other effeminate secret in one open in the other abusers of themselves with mankind secret in the one open in the other nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revelers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God secret in one open in the other Scriptures like these are explained away. In the one camp with woe, we must love one another. And the other is rigidly with the letter of the law. People hiding from sinners instead of reaching out to them. Oh, there's not going to be a worldwide Revival, if we're living in the last of the last days, but oh, there is a revival. (laughs) There is a jubilee. There is a rest of God. There is a freedom from covetousness in these last days. But to enter into that is humanly impossible. Impossible unless one is a true disciple of the word the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must examine ourselves today. Have you or I fallen into one side or the other? Are we sufficient in ourselves or are we experiencing God's rest, revival, and jubilee? Are we living a lifestyle of running to and fro, driven without peace, Are we living simple lives of victory, debt-free, at least getting debt-free, and in in a state of personal revival? Or are we disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? 1 Kings. Well, before 1 Kings, let me say this. Only being a true disciple of Christ can we enter that rest of God. If not, why not? Well, Christ tells us why not. What would keep someone from being a true disciple of the Lord? Nothing other than covetousness and idolatry. Listen to this. Luke 14, 26 and 27. If any man come to me, And hate not his father or mother or wife and children and brethren and sisters and his own life. Cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me. Cannot be my disciple. And Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be that forsaketh not all that he hath. Cannot be my disciple. What don't we understand about the word cannot? And what don't we understand about the word disciple? It means a learner by a relational attachment. A learner about Christ from Christ by a relational attachment to Christ. And what does it mean to hate your father, your mother, and your, your, all of that, and hate your own life? What does that mean? What does it mean to forsake everything we have? Does that mean I have to sell everything I have? And what am I going to do? If I sell my house, what am I, where am I going to live? I'm going to have to have a house. But it's not my house. I forsake it. It's God's house. He can have it if he wants it. I've done that with my health, for heaven's sakes. If you want it, God, you can have it. 
I'm not going to cling to my health and make an idol out of it. If you want it, God, it's yours. If you want this, that, these things that I own, you, you can have them, God. And I love you more than I love my wife, my kids. Oh boy, the family idolatry is a big problem, people. So much so that people drive their own kids to hell. They're so afraid their kids are going to go to hell that they force them there with that fear. Instead of living a life of, of, of the cross and, and not being hypocrites, they drive their kids away by preaching something to them that they don't live themselves. It's time to make a decision. Are we going to get diligent in our relationship with Christ? Because the falling away is going to continue. And if you are a diligent disciple, you're going to be making them as well. We must come to the Jubilee, the Sabbath, the rest of God, and be free from the wrong kind of covetousness. And how do we do that? How do we enter into this kind of revival that we're going to see for the remnant in these last days? First Kings 19, 11, and 12. And he said, go forth, he's talking to Elijah, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire and the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. The Lord caused the, the, uh, the wind that rent the mountains. The Lord caused the earthquake and the Lord caused the fire, but it wasn't in them. And the Lord is causing some of these things that we're seeing today, but he's not in them. What's he in? Shouldn't that still small voice, when we get into that closet, shut the door, get alone with God, and listen to what he's saying to our hearts by the power of his Holy Spirit in his word. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, Help us, God, to not be caught up in nonsense on either side of this fence, but rather to have the balance of such a love for your word that doesn't exclude the fullness and power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we've got just a I think three more lessons left in this series and I look forward to meeting you again here. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.